talk. If you have the angry feeling that financial insiders have robbed the public, damaged the American economy, and been turned loose to do it again, but are not quite sure how it happened or how to fix it, you are about to get the answers you have been looking for. I know what you're thinking. Here's another homeless crank with a notebook full of scribbles about international conspiracies and the Trilateral Commission and aliens from outer space, but that would be wrong. The reason I actually know what I'm talking about is that for over 30 years I have been fighting financial fraud as a criminal prosecutor on the staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission, in private practice, and currently at the California Department of Justice. Just so you know that I'm really a lawyer, I'm going to do some lawyer stuff and tell you right off the bat that these opinions are entirely my own and not necessarily those of any of my current or previous employers. So here's the story. Soon after starting to work in the fall of 1982 as a lawyer in the Division of Enforcement of the Securities and Exchange Commission, I began to wonder why the apparently toothless civil injunctive actions that I was being paid to pursue worked so well. They worked so well, in fact, that our financial markets were then considered the most honest and transparent in the world. Oceans of capital flowed into them from abroad, and their legal underpinnings were studied by other nations in the hope of imitating our success. The answer, I discovered, was that the disclosure and anti-fraud regulations that we administered at the SEC were mostly being enforced not by the government regulators wielding puny injunctive actions, nor by public prosecutors filing criminal cases, but by an army of private plaintiffs' lawyers using the legal system of civil liability that gave the victims of fraud the right to sue stockbrokers, lawyers, accountants, and the other institutional gatekeepers of our financial markets if they associated themselves with dishonest financial disclosure or other violations of law. This system of private lawsuits was created after the collapse of a financial bubble in 1929 caused the Great Depression. Little did I realize in 1982 that during the following 30 years I would see the system of civil liability that had made our financial markets the envy of the world progressively dismantled by Congress and the courts under the guise of deregulation and protecting businesses from frivolous lawsuits. The systematic demo demolition of our legal bulwarks against fraud, while it began in the 80s, rapidly accelerated during the boom years of the 90s. For example, in 1994, years of decisions by lower courts limiting the ability of victims to sue the facilitators of financial fraud culminated in the Central Bank of Denver case, in which our Supreme Court flatly ruled that victims of securities fraud could no longer sue the aiders and abettors of those frauds. The Bank of Denver decision was almost immediately followed up by Congress with the grossly misnamed Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, which might more fitly have been titled the License to Steal Act, and which erected nearly insurmountable pleading and other procedural barriers to private lawsuits for securities fraud. This bill stank so badly that even Bill Clinton wouldn't sign it, but the Congress, which had taken millions of dollars from lobbyists for the accounting profession, passed it over his veto. The depressing list of cases and laws eliminating victims' rights to sue for financial fraud could go on and on, but you get the point. The, predictably, as the legal responsibility of bankers, accountants, lawyers, stockbrokers, and rating agencies connected with false financial disclosures diminished, so did the reliability of those disclosures. This lack of accurate financial information has been the single thread running through the major economic panics of the last three decades. For example, the dishonest valuations of portfolios of real estate securities and other so-called toxic assets that triggered the current crisis simply would not have happened if our system, our legal system, still held the institutional enablers of such frauds financially responsible in our courts for their negligence and misconduct. Later in the current mess, when Lehman Brothers fell, the reason the financial markets froze is that everybody suddenly realized that nobody could know whether an institution with which he dealt was financially sound. This could not have occurred if the financial disclosures of those institutions had been honest and reliable 
as the financial disclosures of most financial institutions were 30 years ago. How could anyone have any confidence in a financial institution with no reliable knowledge of its actual financial condition? Likewise, the savings and loan crisis in the 80s and the early 90s, the failure of LTCM in the late 90s, the failure of Enron in 2001, just to name three more, could not have occurred without the negligence or connivance of the financial gatekeepers involved. In each and every one of the financial crises of the last two decades, there is one common denominator. Highly paid accountants, lawyers, brokerage firms, rating agencies, and other financial gatekeepers prepared, filed, drafted, and certified financial statements and other documents that failed to disclose the true financial condition of the companies that owned worthless, riskier, impaired assets. In spite of all this, not only has nothing been done to reverse the disastrous changes in the law during the last 30 years, but there has been no significant public discussion of such reforms. I ask you, have you heard any? Has anybody been saying these things? No. Instead, we have heard a lot of talk about sending executives to jail and increased enforcement by government bureaucrats, which were not the things that made the system work when it was working and will not fix it now that it's broken. Sending dishonest executives to jail is a good and necessary thing. But there is always someone willing to risk going to jail to steal a billion dollars. But you can't steal that much money without the help of financial gatekeepers who would not help you if they knew, as they did in the 80s, that they might have to pay for the damage. In fact, not only have the firms responsible for our current economic problems not been punished, they have been rewarded with loans from taxes levied on their victims. As a result, all the wrong lessons have been learned. The system remains broken, and the same people who got us into this mess will doubtless produce more and larger ones in the future. Incredibly, even today, our courts and legislatures continue to strip away the last shreds of the system of civil liability that used to keep accounting firms and other gatekeepers relatively honest. Recently, the Supreme Court announced its decision in the Janus Capital case, which eliminated the last vestige of gatekeeper liability under the federal securities laws by barring lawsuits against even primary violators of the anti-fraud laws. To add procedural insult to substantive injury, a few days later, the same Supreme Court decided the Walmart case, which puts yet another procedural ob obstacle in the way of large groups of people defrauded by dishonest businesses. What can they be thinking? The last time a massive speculative bubble wrecked the economy in 1929, the conditions that allowed it to get so out of hand were fixed by changes in the law. The Securities Act of 1933, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, the rules adopted under them, and the early decisions by the courts to allow their enforcement by private lawsuits against institutional gatekeepers like accountants, lawyers, and brokerage firms were highly effective in making reliable financial information available to investors and gave us the relatively honest and highly successful financial system that after the Second World War helped produce three decades of broadly based prosperity. The legislation and decisions that during the last 30 years have dismantled that successful legal framework and caused our current mess could be undone by Congress with one or two pages of legislation. However, the powerful financial interests that have spent the last 30 years campaigning for their license to steal and that since Bill Clinton's presidency have controlled both major political parties through their political contributions do not want their gravy train stopped. Our only hope is that an informed and aroused citizenry will force Congress to act. This video is an attempt at a beginning. If it makes sense to you, please share it and forward it. If you are incapable of understanding or too apathetic to help, things will only get worse. On the other hand, if one person out of a hundred forwards and shares this video, to all his email lists and social media, like Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, the truth will be known.
and all the energy that is being wasted in fruitless expressions of anger and frustration, like the Occupy demonstrations, can be redirected where it will do some good. Once people know what happened and how to fix it, candidates will try to get their votes, and corrupt politicians who resist will be swept out of office. This is the age of the network. Knowledge is power. The network spreads knowledge. Use the power. Forward, share, and make a difference.